Thank you, Julian. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I last was in one of these lecture series about two years ago in a lecture on the, uh, the Silk Route. And I was struck at the time by the uh, really interesting questions that we had in the question and answer session at the end of the lecture. So I'm hoping we'll have time to discuss some of the issues that I'm raising tonight as well. So if I run a little on the short side, it'll be because I'm trying to leave some time for the questions. I hope you'll have noticed that, uh, uh, if that calls for me, I'm not here, by the way. Uh, it's just my wife wondering when I'm getting home. Um, I hope you noticed that in the title of the lecture tonight, Thermopylae, the Battle for Europe, I put a question mark. And that question mark is important because I don't want to be making any blanket assertions about the importance of the Battle of Thermopylae. Instead, I hope to raise some questions, not only about the battle, but more importantly about the way the battle has been received, the way it functions, as it were, in a continuing discourse that we have regarding our history and relations between the West and other places. And those categories are all to be understood as having rabbit's ears around them. But before we get into any of those broader theoretical questions, let's begin with some of the basics. Uh, let me just situate this for you in case there are any of you that don't carry um, Thermopylae around in your head. Where? Central Greece. I'll show you the location. And the topography is actually quite important for understanding the battle. We'll get to that in a little while. When? August of 480 BC. That's also important because we'll be talking about some of the battles that occurred before it and after it. The exact date is open to some discussion. Some people go for the 17th of August, some for the 18th. It really doesn't matter. Uh, the protagonists. This is where the story starts to get interesting. Hopefully you're all aware of the fact that it is a battle between the Persians and the Greeks. The exact numbers, though, are open to some contestation. If you believe Herodotus, and everyone should, there were 2.6 million combatants and camp followers uh, amongst the Persians. Uh, sober, prosaic, unromantic modern historians have lowered that figure to around 100,000. Uh, I'll let you decide which camp you want to be in. Uh, and for the Greeks, even though the story tends to revolve around the 300 Spartans, uh, there are in fact others there, both from the Peloponnese and elsewhere. And again, depending upon which of the ancient sources you take, Herodotus or Diodorus as your guide, probably somewhere in the vicinity of five to 7,000 in the early parts of the battle, uh, and uh, 300 Spartans by the end, and 700 Thespians, and we'll talk a little bit about them later on. Why should we be talking about a battle that occurred nearly 500 years before Christ? Um, the, the battle specifically, in tactical terms and strategic terms, was about preventing the penetration of southern Greece by a very large uh, Persian army. But in fact, as we'll see, it's really nested within a much broader context of conflict between Greece and Persia. And in fact, I want to tease out some of those implications early on in the lecture. And as for the outcome, if you don't know who won the battle, you should just leave now, because uh, honestly, you have no business being here. All right, it was the Greeks, okay? All right, just in case anyone's feeling humiliated. The significance. There are many people who believe that Western civilization as we know it would not have come about had the Greeks not been victorious at Thermopylae. And so I somewhat provocatively put up a picture of the Parthenon because the battle resonates extraordinarily richly in the imagination both of historians and of the general public as a seminal moment. That's why it's a part of this series, series a, a, a great battle that may have determined the history of the West. Now, we need to unpack that idea. There are all sorts of political implications that lie behind that way of viewing history, which we will talk about. Uh, one of the ways of testing this approach, of course, is to do alternative history and ask what would have happened if they hadn't won? What would have happened if the Persians had won? And that's an interesting thought experiment, but I'm actually not going to pursue it any further because, not to sound too much like someone who's watched a lot of Star Trek, but there are so many timelines in history that if you start talking about a change at any given moment, it's really impossible to predict what the other changes are that would have accrued from it. There's really no way of saying. So if, if you want to stand up at the end and ask me what would have happened if the Persians had won, I will tell you right now, I can't answer that. If the Persians hadn't won, then um, 
if the Persians, excuse me, had won, uh, then the Greeks would not have gloriously imagined that they had be- defeated the world superpower. They would not have had a cultural flowering that, flowering that produced this. They would not have produced an Alexander the Great who then went to conquer the Persians and to do to the Persians what the Persians had tried to do to the Greeks. Without an Alexander, you would not have had Greek culture being spread across the ancient Near East. One can go on and on and on and on. So I have no idea, frankly, what would have happened if the Persians had won. Let's go back, though, and talk a little bit about who these Persians are, particularly because, as you're going to see later on in the lecture, we are discussing here a battle of images. The Greek view of the Persians, of course, in the 5th century, was that the great king, as he was called, was like Napoleon in the imagination of the English, a bogeyman who used to scare children, the great king. In fact, the Achaemenid dynasty, the dynasty that ruled Persia at the end of the 6th century, ruled over an extraordinarily large area of land and did so generally with a relatively light touch. They imposed low taxes. As long as tribute came in, they were not harsh to their subjects. The empire was uh, close to its height under the reign of Darius, who ruled from 521 to 485, a full generation. And his reign was marked by such dramatic developments as the introduction of gold coinage. These coins, in fact, were known to the Greeks as Darics, named after the King Darius, showing him striding valiantly forward with a bow in one hand and a spear in the other. These are the weapons used by the Persians. He built an extensive network of roads that crossed the entire empire, and in a moment I'm going to show you the extent of that empire. He began the building of a royal capital at Persepolis, which is merely the Greek name meaning the capital or the city of the Persians. He uh, did uh, attempt... Uh, an invasion of Greece uh, at Marathon, which was turned back famously. And we'll have occasion to talk a little bit about the impact of that battle in a moment. But take a look at this, the empire of Darius. And I want to point out to you, if, I can, if you can still hear me, Greece is only that territory. This is the expanse controlled by the Persians. So I want to make a point right at the very start. You will see in the imagery and in the discussions of this battle that there are two sides facing each other, and it often seems as if there is a kind of equivalence, Greeks and Persians. But in reality, Greece is a pimple on the end of the Persian world. And from the Persian point of view, it is merely the farthest realm away on the other side of the Ione, of the, of the sea a tiny and insignificant area that had very little to offer the Persians, in fact. And if we ask, well, why were the Persians interested in this area? One simple answer is because expansion is what the Persian Empire did. Now, that may sound like an oddly simplistic idea, but we are so conditioned in modern history to look for complex causes for imperial expansion, economic motives, religious motives, and so forth, that we often ignore the brutally simple fact that in the ancient world, empires expanded because they could. They simply took more territory when it was available to them. And in one respect, and you might find this a frightening thought, the domino theory actually applies quite well in ancient history. I know it doesn't for modern history, and we got into all sorts of problems in Vietnam precisely because of that kind of thinking. But in the ancient world, Empires simply gobbled up the next territory if they were able to. And in one respect, that map illustrates quite simply that Greece was the next domino to fall to the Persians around 500 BC. In the heartland of Persia, in what is today southwest Iran, Darius and his son Xerxes built an extraordinary new capital, Persepolis. And this photo gives you some idea of the the, 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 the size and the monumental quality of this site. For example, here at the entry gate, the gate of all nations that, as it was known, you see these monumental figures, uh, each of them um, more than 20 feet high, flanking the entrance and imposing on the person coming in an impression of the extraordinary power of this kingdom. Similarly, as you move towards the main hall of one of the palaces, you find uh, these figures cut in light relief that are virtually life-size, so that they are a kind of permanent stone version of what's actually being done by the humans who are coming up into the hall for an audience with the great king. 
The effect of this would have been quite astonishing. It is meant to overawe people. The Apadana, the Great Hall, Epicepolis, is over 100,000 square meters, 72 columns, each of them 20 meters tall. Vastly bigger than anything known in the Greek world at this time. Although, in fact, there were Greek masons working here, as we now know. The visual arts of the Persian Empire are designed to impress people with the power of the great king, to show in a monumental form the kind of procession that would be taking place in live form. Gee, where have we heard that before? The Parthenon and the Parthenon friezes showing in relief a permanent stone version of what's going on, namely the Panathenaic procession. The contact between Greeks and Persians culturally goes much deeper than we often like to, uh, to admit. We see here figures coming before the great king and uh, both armed with uh, bows and quivers and presenting their tribute to the king, coming from all around the empire. Uh, for those who study ethnicity, these reliefs are incredibly important because they are one of the first places where we have strong evidence for the visual markers being used to show the nationality and the ethnic origin of a particular people, the Assyrians and the Cilicians and so forth, shown by their various forms of headdress. It was an empire also which in its official ideology was pious. The Achaemenids claimed that they ruled thanks to the authority of the all-knowing, self-created god of wisdom and enlightenment known as Ahura Mazda. And that god is normally shown in this cartouche-like figure uh, in various media here in these beautiful glazed bricks from Susa. So that when Darius actually carves inscriptions talking about his authority and power, he says, I am Darius the great king, king of kings, son of Histaspes, an Achaemenian, or an Achaemenid, by the favor of Ahura Mazda. These are the countries I brought into my possession. Elam, Media, Babylonia, Arabia, Syria, Egypt, and so it goes on, listing all of the various countries, as well as the Ionians who are of the mainland and of the sea. And these great kings also built monumental tombs for themselves at Nakshi Rustam in southwest Iran, cut deep into the, uh, the bedrock with these uh, beautifully finished facades, uh, often shown with reliefs and inscriptions recounting their deeds and their accomplishments. Also, you'll see here later dynasties such as the Sassanids also built uh, reliefs into the rock here and continued the practice then of advertising their power. One of the inscriptions that goes with the... Uh, uh, that, um, gives us evidence about the Achaemenids is from Behustun. And I want you to pay attention for a moment to the language here. Uh, these are the names, and I think you might, will be able to recognize some of the Greek names uh, that are associated with these. I am Darius, Darius in Greek, the king, son of Ishtashpa, of the Hakamanasiya dynasty, king of kings. I am king in Parsa. My father is Vistashpa. Vistashpa's father is Arishama. Arshama's father was Ariyamna, Ariyamna's father was Kispis, and Kispis' father was Hakama. Now the reason I point this out to you is that you'll find in the Greek author Herodotus a similar genealogy, which I put for you here on the right. If I fail to punish the Athenians, says Xerxes, let me be no child of Darius, the son of Histaspes, the son of Asamis, the son of Ariaramnes, the son of Taspes, and let me be no son of Atossa, the daughter of Cyrus, and so it goes on. Now, there are two things I want to draw to your attention here. The first is that the evidence from the actual genealogies strongly suggests that Herodotus had seen one of these inscriptions. So that's interesting. It does suggest some kind of eyewitness account. The second is that this is clearly turned into a story. It's not just a bald genealogy. It begins with the lines, if I fail to punish the Athenians. So it raises the question, where does this hostility come from that Herodotus is describing here? Well, the source of the conflict mentioned in that inscription, and in fact the source of the conflict that leads to Thermopylae, is a result of the uh, Persian expansion towards the west of the realm that I just showed you, and a revolt that took place in the coast of what is today Turkey. This is the Aegean Sea. Here is Athens and the mainland of Greece and the island of Euboea. Here's the Aegean. This is modern day Turkey and by around 500 BC, the cities on that coast were all Greek speaking cities. They were also cities that had largely come under Persian control as the Persians expanded west. 
In 499, many of these cities went into revolt. They were particularly annoyed at the tyrants who'd been installed as puppet governors by the Persians. The Athenians joined the Ionians from this coast in this revolt, and in 498, they burnt Sardis, a Persian provincial capital. Now, the Persians in, uh, ended the revolt uh, five years later in 493. They re-established control over Ionia and they began preparations for what was going to be, quite simply, a punitive expedition against the Greeks. Now, before we go into the details of that, we should talk a little bit about the actual techniques of warfare that we're going to be seeing in the course of this lecture. I've mentioned that Persia is huge and Greece is small. But what the Greeks have going for them is their mode of battle. They fight as hoplites, men who carry the round shield called the hoplon that goes from the shield to the knees. Below that, they... I think I just popped my, uh, my microphone, excuse me. Below that, they wear greaves that run down uh, to their feet, and on their heads, they wear bronze helmets. Men fighting in formation like that are protected, essentially, across their entire body. The only area that's vulnerable is this right side as they thrust a spear, but that area is also enclosed by the shield of the man to their right, protecting them to the left. So it is like a, a, a spiny porcupine or a hedgehog. What they're fighting against are Persians, who for the most part are wearing wool, linen, shields made of either leather or wicker. Are we still okay? Oh, it's okay, thanks. I like to walk around. Thank you. Can I walk around, or do you want me to use the flashy thing? Walk around. Flashy thing. All right, those in favor of walk around? Those in favor of flashy thing? All right, neutral men of the devil's allies, for those of you who didn't vote. So we've got uh, really two different modes of warfare. And when the two confront each other, what it's going to look like will essentially be, though this is a, a rather melodramatic uh, computer-generated illustration, it's going to be a slaughter because those carrying bronze and steel and iron are going to be able to cut their way through the wicker and wood shields of their opponents. So, on the one hand, we have a much larger Persian force, but we have, in terms of the technology of ancient warfare, a vastly better armed and prepared Greek army. The actual first confrontation in these wars on the Greek mainland, not the burning of Sardis, takes place at Marathon in 490. And you all know the story of that, namely that the Persians, as they're coming ashore, are attacked by the Athenians with an army probably 10,000 strong. It captures the Persians as they are in the process of unloading their troops, and it essentially drives them back into the sea. I have the most gloriously hokey graphic to show you of this. See, it's interactive. <laughs> if you're a Republican, I apologize that the Persians are red and will lose. I didn't design this. I'm just shamelessly stealing it from the internet. All right, here we've got the Persian forces coming ashore in their ships and then uh, assembling here. The Greeks come at a charge, and Herodotus says this three times, that the Greeks charge them at a run. Try wearing 60 pounds of hoplite armor in formation and running over a mile of open terrain to engage with the Persians. And you'll understand how the extraordinary discipline of these men was the key to their success. The second key to their success was that the Greeks made the center of their line shallow and strengthened and reinforced their wings. As a result, when they hit the Persians, the Persians were able to push back through the center, but then expose themselves on their wings to the larger, better armed Greek forces that enveloped the center put them to flight, and put the wings to flight as well. The second phase is even better. I've always thought it looks like they all caught measles, but... <laughs> and as I say, I didn't design this, so honestly, I would spell marsh, M-A-R-S-H. I don't know why it's marshy up there. Marshy. But it's a useful graphic. The effect of this is vastly out of proportion to the actual battle itself. 
the men who fought at Marathon were acknowledged as heroes. And when I say heroes, I mean it in the Homeric sense. They are men who are now regarded as larger than life. They were known forever afterwards as the Marathonomikoi, the men who fought at Marathon. When Aeschylus was buried years later, his major source of pride was not that he had won the crown so many times at the festivals for his plays. It was that he had fought at Marathon and that his brother had actually grabbed the prow of a Persian ship and had his arm hacked off by a Persian. These were the men of the Alamo, they were the men of Gallipoli, they were the men of Iwo Jima, all rolled into one. And it's hard to convey the importance of this to the Greeks without recognizing once again that the size of the Persian domain, I'm showing you all of Central Asia here, made this victory totally unexpected. Here's the heartland of Persia. It's an empire that includes Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, Gaza, and Egypt, Turkey, Armenia, Iran over here, going all the way up to Tajikistan and across here to Afghanistan and Uzbekistan. To have defeated that army was an accomplishment of superhuman proportions. And it triggered in Athenian culture an astonishing degree of confidence in what they were able to do. The enemy they were fighting against was one ruled by semi-divine god kings, if you will. But in fact, Darius, whose forces were repulsed at Marathon, did not live to conduct the second wave of the Persian invasion of Greece. He died about five years later, and it was left to his son Xerxes, who ascended the throne in the middle of the 480s, to take on the job of both expanding Persian power and punishing definitively the Athenians and the rest of the Greeks for their defiance of his power. And so it was that in 480, his army, massed from all over the Greek world, descended upon Greece. The Greeks knew about it for at least two years in advance. Reports poured out of what is today Turkey, Western Asia, saying that the king was assembling an army the likes of which had never been seen before. So great was it that it would be accompanied by a fleet that would serve as its uh, support. So there was both a naval wing and an army, an army of such a size that when it came to Greece, it actually cut a canal through one of the fingers of the Chalcidice so that the fleet would not have to go around and could stay in close contact with the army. There were reports of it draining rivers dry as it crossed through the Greek territory. Assembled here in what the Greeks would call Asia, it crossed over into Europe and marched along through Thrace, down here into Macedon, finally here through Thessaly, and it's at Thermopylae that we will finally have a confrontation in the second great Persian invasion between the Greeks and the Persians. Thermopylae is essentially a delaying tactic to slow the Persian advance. And I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. I'm just going to briefly mention, and I'll say a little bit more about these later, the other battles that also took place in the course of this campaign. Salamis, which is located here off the coast of Athens, also took place in 480, in September of 480. And a year later, the Plataeans were finally routed in a land battle here in the center of Greece. I point these out because I want to be very clear about the fact that Thermopylae did not end the Persian invasions. The Persians didn't leave in 480. They stayed at least another full year, and there were two major engagements after Thermopylae. So since it was not a resounding victory of the Greeks, it does further the question, raises the question of why it was so important in the Greek imagination and why it has remained that way. But I'm getting ahead of myself. The army, as I said, is moving down here into central Greece. The Greeks at one point have actually marched as far north as here, the Vale of Tempe. The Greek army assembles, they look out, they see the Persian forces, they realize they are outmanned 10 to 1, and they promptly turn around and run away. An inglorious retreat. 
it's finally at Thermopylae that they will make a stand. But even then, it will only be a relatively small force. And this has often raised questions in people's minds about why here and why these numbers. Well, we can, I think, explain this a little bit more clearly if we take another look at a map of Greece in greater detail. Greece is a land that has a mountain chain essentially running from the northwest down through the southeast. And it naturally divides the land into a series of small and discrete micro-regions. If you are coming from the north, from up here, from Macedon, you eventually make your way into this very large fertile plain called Thessaly, an area famous in antiquity for the horses that were raised there. But as you move further south, and remember your aim is eventually to get down here to Athens, and maybe the Peloponnese as well, as you move further south, the mountains on one side, here, and the sea on the other side, here, have the effect of funneling any invasion force down into a narrower and narrower defile. And so there are certain places in Greece where battles over the centuries have been fought in exactly the same location because of exactly the same strategic conditions. Commonwealth forces fought the Germans in exactly this spot in the 1940s as well. All right, so our story is bringing us down, the Persian army here coming down to this area. And now I'm going to show you a close-up of this region right here. So please try and fix in memory where we are in the landmass of Greece generally, central Greece. Now we're in a situation where the mountains are running down here towards the southeast, also another outcrop of mountains here in Magnesia. And so a land army is making its way south and is essentially funneled into this area right here. And because these are the modern place names, it doesn't show you, but this is Thermopylae, this open area right here. Now, one of the things that's amazing about the Battle of Thermopylae and modern attempts to understand it is that when you go to the landscape today, one is usually thunderstruck asking, how did the Greeks think that here they were going to be able to hold off an army that was ten times larger? Surely this is a large open plain that's made for a great engagement between two armies where the larger army will win. Now I have to ask you to use your imagination. This is the west, we're marching towards the east, this is the route taken by the Persians, and everything that you see that is flat in this picture is modern alluviation. This is all soil that has been deposited in the last 2,000 years. And in antiquity, everything that you see here, everything here, including the National Highway, all of this was underwater. So that when Herodotus describes the conditions at Thermopylae, he actually makes sense because he says the mountains come down to the sea and at the base of the mountains there is a track that is sufficiently wide for a single cart to make its way through. So you look at this now and it's impossible to get a view of Thermopylae that's accurate because the landscape has changed so completely. I ask you to keep that in mind because now if you imagine this is water and this is mountain, you'll see that that funnel as we come down through Thessaly, is reaching a choke point. And it is exactly at that point that about a generation earlier, the local inhabitants of here, the Phocians, had erected a wall across the pathway. And by rebuilding that wall and defending that one small spot, no wider than this platform, the Greeks hoped to hold the Persians back, at least for a while. Now, there is a popular view, it was in the last couple of movies about the 300, that the Spartans made their way up there under the command of a king who was disobeying Spartan orders, going for a stroll up north with a few hundred bodyguards. That's not what Herodotus tells us. His account for why there were Spartans there is as follows. The force with Leonidas was sent forward by the Spartans in advance of their main body that the sight of them might encourage the allies to fight. They'd already retreated once from Tempe. So there was always the chance that the Greeks would see the Persians and then run away, but not if the Spartans were there, the best warriors in Greece, and hinder them from going over to the Medes. That's the other dirty secret of these wars. As the Persians advanced through Greek territory, many Greek states simply Medized, meaning went over to the Persians as was likely they might have done had they seen that Sparta was backward. 
They intended presently, when they had celebrated the Carnaian festival, which was what now kept them at home, to leave a garrison in Sparta and hasten in full force to join the army. So this is an advance guard of Spartans that's meant to show the flag and build up the morale of the Greeks in advance of the rest of the Spartan army coming. The rest of the Allies intended to act similarly, for it happened that the Olympic festival fell exactly at this same period. None of them looked to see the contest that Thermopylae decided so speedily, wherefore they were content to send forward a mere advance guard. Such, accordingly, were the intentions of the Allies. So it was meant to be a holding action until the rest of the Greeks could get there. And a second feature of this that's worth remembering is that this action at Thermopylae, where the mountains come down to the sea, was complemented by a naval engagement. Herodotus describes it in detail in Book 8, which was to take place here off the coast of this sanctuary to Artemis called Artemision. The Persian forces were arrayed here at Aphetai, the Greek forces here, and at around the same time that the Greek army was, and the Spartans in particular, was fighting the Persians here on land, the navy led by the Athenians was fighting the Persians here at sea. So these should be seen as two complementary battles that are designed to hinder the progress of the Persians as they come any further south. For three days, this force, originally totaling, as I said, between five and 7,000 Greeks, kept the Persians at bay. They were led by Leonidas, the Spartan king, and his 300 Spartans, who held the pass at the hot gates in this area here, where the track between the mountains and the sea was so narrow that only a single cart could pass, as I mentioned. They reinforced the wall there, and they came out in front of the wall only to sally out and fight against the Persian forces and then rapidly retreat. On the first day of the battle, they faced the Medes, uh, close allies of the Persians, and defeated them. The following day, the great king sent in the immortals, the elite group of Spartan warriors who were his personal bodyguard, and once again, the confrontation between men with arrows and pikes and wicker shields and Greeks wearing bronze and carrying uh, steel-pointed spears and swords was no contest, and the Greeks were victorious. But during that second day, a traitor appeared at the Persian court, telling the king that he, he knew of a pass that began at the western end of Thermopylae, climbed into the hills, continued through the hills, and came down at the eastern end of the pass behind the Greek forces. His name was Ephialtes. Once the news reached Leonidas that a Persian contingent was in the hills following the Anapaya Pass and about to come down behind him, it was clear that his position had been turned. And so all of the forces were dismissed, save for the 300 Spartans and the 700 men of Thespiae, who were all volunteers and decided to stay, even though they knew that their position was completely forlorn. They need to be honored as well. Herodotus gives an extraordinarily evocative description of what happened on that third day. The Greeks have been fighting for three days, They've repulsed the best of the Persians. They now know that their position has been turned. Xerxes and the barbarians attacked. But Leonidas and the Greeks, knowing that they were going to their deaths, advanced now much farther than before into the wider part of the pass. Throughout the day before, they had sallied out into the narrow way and fought there, guarding the defensive wall. Now, however, they joined battle outside the narrows, and many of the barbarians fell. For the leaders of the companies beat everyone with whips from behind, urging them forward. Many of them were pushed into the sea and drowned. Far more were trampled alive by each other with no regard for who perished. Since the Greeks knew that they must die at the hands of those who had come around the mountain, they displayed the greatest strength they had against the barbarians fighting recklessly and desperately, and dying to the man. It's a defeat in military terms. Within a week back home, we celebrated Anzac Day, and I can tell you, a national identity can certainly be built around a defeat. 
The modern view of this, eloquently put by Victor Davis Hanson, I think helps us to understand why the defeat has been transformed into a kind of victory. Almost immediately, contemporary Greeks saw Thermopylae as a critical moral and cultural lesson. In universal terms, a small free people had willingly outfought huge numbers of imperial subjects who advanced under the lash. You can hear him echoing the language of Herodotus there, as every good historian should. More specifically, the Western idea that soldiers themselves decide where, how, and against whom they will fight was contrasted against the Eastern notion of despotism and monarchy, freedom proving the stronger idea as the more courageous fighting the Greeks at Thermopylae and their later victories at Salamis and Plataea attested. This has clearly moved into a, a larger discourse comparing East and West, and Thermopylae has continued to function that way, particularly recently. The mythologizing that accrued around the events at Thermopylae go back to within days, if not hours, of the death of the men there. For example, this is the epitaph written for the men of Thermopylae by Simonides. Oxen angelein lacedomoniois hoti teda kimitha tois kenon rimasi pethomenoi. Stranger, go tell the Spartans we lie here, obedient to their orders. It quickly became the stuff of legend. But, before we subscribe too completely to this, we have to take into account, and I'm not going to dismiss this, I'm not a crass revisionist, I'm a sophisticated revisionist. <laughs> that remains to be seen, doesn't it? Um, we need to put this into context in a couple of ways. And the first is by addressing the simple fact that militarily it was a disaster. The Greeks accomplished nothing, holding up the Persians for three days. The Persians could waste that much time scouring the countryside for supplies and water. The war actually continued, and from the Persian point of view, though we have no Persian sources for this, this was probably an insignificant blip on the radar. From the point of view of the Athenians, it had done nothing to salvage their situation. The Persian army was still advancing down into central and southern Greece. And so the Athenians did what any pious Greek people would do. They consulted the Pythia, the oracle of Apollo at Delphi. He is sitting on the tripod waiting to be inspired by the god. And Apollo proved to be singularly unhelpful because the oracle that he gave can be loosely translated as, get out, you're all doomed. It's a little bit fancier in the Greek, but the message was very clear. So clear that the ambassadors who'd gone to Delphi were afraid to return to Athens with this unequivocal message. And so again, in good Greek fashion, they went back the second day and said, could we have another oracle? <laughs> the second oracle proved to be a little bit more helpful in that it was sufficiently ambiguous that no one really knew what it meant. The oracle maintained that a wooden wall would remain safe, that alone. This news was brought back to Athens and instantly the population divided into two halves. One half saying, well, the wooden wall is clearly the barricade that runs around the Acropolis. It's made of wood. Ergo, it's a wooden wall. Ergo, the Acropolis will be safe. Some more sophisticated interpreters of oracles, notably Themistocles, pointed out that the other meaning of the wooden wall, taken more metaphorically, was a wall of ships that the Athenians had recently built and by looking carefully at the language of the oracle, Themistocles was able to persuade the Athenians that it was this wooden wall which was meant. And so the majority of the Athenians actually evacuated the city. People often forget this. They think of Thermopylae as a great victory, but a month later, Athens was sacked. The only people who stayed in the city were either too old and too infirm, or people who had decided that despite all other interpretations, it was the wooden wall of the palisade around the Acropolis that would hold firm. And they all died. Every one of them slaughtered. The rest of the Athenians were evacuated to the other side of the Saronic Gulf, and their fleet took up position just off the coast of Athens, off the coast of uh, Athens here and Salamis here. And it was here that the Athenians and the Spartans led a Greek fleet 
which, hemmed in by the Persians at this end and by an Egyptian fleet which sailed right round the other side of the island, it was this uh, Greek fleet which then decisively destroyed the, uh, the Persian fleet at the Battle of Salamis in September of 480. This too, like Marathon, was a completely unexpected victory. The great king actually left, though his army remained. His army moved into northern central Greece for winter quarters, and in 479 they returned a second time to the south, and it was there in 479 that at the Battle of Plataea, the combined army of the Greeks, in its full force now, not just 300 of an advance guard, faced the Persians in a set-piece battle, a hoplite engagement, and decisively defeated the Persians, leading to the, uh, the, the Persians fleeing completely from Greece and the absolute end of the Persian invasions. But it was a victory that had come at a terrible price. Athens had been sacked twice. The building that you see here, the Parthenon, is erected right on top of an earlier version of the Parthenon that was under construction in 480 and was destroyed by the Persians. If you've ever been to Athens and you've been down in Plaka and looked up at the Acropolis from the northern side, you can still see column drums built into the wall as the Greeks of the next generation showed that though the temple had been destroyed, it was still sacred to them and was now being used as part of the defense of the city. So that's the first context that we need to keep in mind for understanding Thermopylae. That is that militarily it was a failure and the war actually continued for another full year. We also need to think more about the impact of this on the Greeks themselves. And this is where the story I think gets complicated but interesting. Heroism, 300 men, Staying to die? Absolutely. For the first time now, the Greek word for freedom, eleutheria, enters political discourse. Earlier, it was a term that was used merely to mark the difference between a free man and a slave. It's as simple as that. You're either free or you're a slave. Now it's used of entire communities, meaning we are a free people because we are not subject to the laws of any other power. We are autonomous. We enjoy autonomia. So there's certainly a change in political thinking and a great confidence that comes with the notion that they are themselves a free people. If I can digress for a moment, I have to tell you a story that illustrates this. Most Greek plays up until this stage had always been about mythological scenes. They'd been about you know, Agamemnon coming back from the war and being chopped down, episodes like that, taken from ye oldie worldy stuff. After the Persian Wars, the Greeks start putting on plays about contemporary events. The play, The Persians, Persei, by Aeschylus, is first produced in 472, only eight years after the Battle of Salamis and the Battle of Thermopylae. Only eight years later, they're putting on, essentially, recent events. It would be like growing up on a diet of Shakespeare and then for the first time going to the movies and watching a movie set in Iraq during the Iraq War or Afghanistan. All of a sudden, contemporary events are worthy of discussion. Now, in the course of that play, Persei, as I said, produced only in 472, eight years after the war, at one point, the Queen Mother is talking to the leader of the chorus, and she says, who are these Athenians? Who, who is their master? The chorus leader replies, they call no man master. They are a free people. In the 1960s, when Greece was being ruled by a military junta, that play was performed at Epidaurus. And when that line was uttered by the actors, the audience, as one, 15,000 people, stood up and began cheering as a mark of their defiance of the junta. If that was the effect in 1966, can you imagine the effect of that line in 472, when many of the men in the audience of that production were the men who had fought in those battles. It's electric. But there's a flip side, and the flip side is this. It's also the beginning of the use of the term barbarian, not in a neutral sense of someone who speaks blah, 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 blah. I don't understand him. It's that thick Swedish accent, blah, 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 blah. They're now barbarians. That is to say, inferior to us Greeks. People who are not worthy of any sort of respect. And so it becomes a term of abuse. Greek confidence in the period after the Persian Wars leads to an astonishing cultural flowering of both architecture, philosophy, history, mathematics, medicine, you name it. 
But this triumph, it could be argued, produces a mood of triumphalism as well, which is less than attractive. Now, I don't wish to deny the importance of Thermopylae or the heroism of the men who fought there. David captures it beautifully in this painting of Leonidas at Thermopylae. The man at the back, cutting onto the stone, is actually putting on Simonides' epitaph, Go Tell the Spartans, which I read for you a moment ago. So it's remained a touchstone for cultures that are asserting the importance of individual heroism and self-sacrifice. But it raises the question also of whose Xerxes we're talking about. Young Iranian students on the web have objected, and not without good reason, to the fact that a figure from their history of some nobility and power is now demonized as an eight-foot-tall Brazilian metrosexual <laughs> with more body piercings than you'll see on South Street on a Saturday night. <laughs> and in the recent movie, when Greeks and Persians interact, there is an ominous What's that thing below the text? Yes, it's a subtext, except it's so obvious in this film that it's almost the text itself. Namely, that there is a threat coming from the East. This is not from 480 BC, this is 2005. So we're replaying, in a worse version, the most hideous stereotypes of East and West. What is that threat? Well, when the great king languorously lays his fingers on the shoulders of Leonidas facing away from him, the threat is quite simply that Greece will be buggered by the Persians if they don't resist. Now, you might feel that by taking a trashy Hollywood movie, I'm doing no service to the story of Thermopylae, but I have to respond that in fact this notion of what you do with an enemy and how the enemy is to be imagined culturally is not the creation of Hollywood, it's the creation of the Greeks in the 5th century BC. That's a Persian. And it's a Persian because he's wearing flimsy gym jams. And he's going, oh, please don't hurt me, because advancing on the other side of the vase is a Greek with an erect phallus who was about to bugger the Persian. <laughs> this vase is called the Eurymedon vase. It's quite famous in Greek art circles. And the reason it's called the Eurymedon vase is because inscribed on it in Greek are the words, I am Eurymedon. Eurymedon was a battle fought in 468, 12 years after Thermopylae and Salamis. And so the owner of this vase pouring drinks for his mates at dinner parties or drinking parties in Athens in the 460s was saying, we showed those Persians a thing or two. We did it at Thermopylae, we did it at Salamis, and we did it at Eurymedon. So very quickly, this story of heroism, it's hard to read Herodotus's passage about Leonidas advancing out to face certain death without choking up. Very quickly, that story was vulgarized and represented and demonstrated the very worst side of the Greek character, or you might like to say the victor's character. It can apply to anyone. This tendency to play with stereotypes of East and West and then to vilify our opponents is one that continues up until the present. The late not lamented Muammar Gaddafi being made the subject of ridicule here as some hideous cross-dresser is in a direct line of descent from the way the Greeks treated the Persians in their imagination after the victories of the Persian Wars. In fact, in the period after the Persian Wars, very quickly the Greeks began creating an image of the other. And that the other is a label that applies to everyone who wasn't Greek, but most particularly the Persians. They were always shown as effeminate, beardless as opposed to the manly bearded male, Greek male, dressed as opposed to the heroically naked Greek male, who was shown usually as an athlete or a warrior, using things like bows and arrows as opposed to manly swords and spears. The posture of the lower figure, again, representing this feminine, soft, boyish image. 
And if Persians represented effeminate men, then in the Greek imagination there was nothing worse, nothing more monstrous than women who fought as men. They were unnatural. Women are supposed to be in the house having your children. The idea that they would be in battle under arms was a hideous violation of the natural order in the eyes of the Greeks. Connoted by the fact that in Greek stories, these Amazons, in order to make it easier to pull the bow and arrow, cut off a breast, leading to their name. A madzdon in Greek means breastless. So I raise these for you because I want to pose a question. When we look at something like the Elgin marbles, the Metopes from the Parthenon, we cannot help but feel these are masterpieces of a culture at its absolute height, at its zenith. These are powerfully evocative. These are central images in the Western canon, absolutely. But the Greeks who made this were Athenians who were celebrating their empire, an empire which they acquired as a result of the confidence and the navy gained in the aftermath of the Persian Wars, an empire in which they gradually turned allies into subjects, an empire in which the Greeks, in assembly, the Athenians, would make a decision to slaughter all the men of a city that had gone into revolt against them. Empires are empires. The Athenians defeated the Persian Empire, yay. The Athenians become an empire, boo. Yes, it's a black and white story, but those are the oddities of this. I'm trying to complicate Thermopylae, and I'm almost going to finish here, but there's one last element that I want to throw into the mix. The heroism of the men at Thermopylae is beyond doubt. The aftermath is complex. It includes a great cultural flowering, but it also includes an ugly side of Athenian imperialism. If then we want to try to extract something from Thermopylae that is more individual, and less complicated by the nuances of empire, perhaps we should be looking for what I would call an internal Thermopylae, a moral Thermopylae. Constantine Cavafy, the great and glorious modern Greek poet, composed a poem that I think captures this. Honor to those who in the life they lead define and guard a Thermopylae, never betraying what is right, consistent and just in all they do, but showing pity also and compassion, generous when they're rich and when they're poor, still generous in small ways, still helping whenever they can, always speaking the truth, yet without hating those who lie. And even more honor is due to them when they foresee, as many do foresee, that Ephialtis will turn up in the end, that the Medes will break through after all.